Welcome everyone to the final session of the Robin Report Annual Forum. I'm Deborah Patton, editor of the Robin Report. And today we have Robin Lewis, who's in the sunny Florida Keys, and William Lauder, who's the executive chairman of the Estee Lauder Companies, who's in Westchester. So they're gonna discuss one of the ind industry's most critical natural resources, its people, plus a lot of other spontaneous, interesting things to discuss about retail. So I'm gonna be back in about 40 minutes for a Q&A. And please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you wanna ask Robin or William. Mm -hmm. And before I pass it off to Robin, I just wanna say thank you to Intel, who's the sponsor of our annual forum. And Robin, take it away. Thank you very much, Deborah. And good afternoon, all of you, and welcome. Uh, and also, thanks so much for joining us. I, I think, however you will, uh, be in for some very relevant knowledge today, uh, quite frankly, because we are fortunate enough, and I am honored to have my good friend, William Lauder, joining us in this conversation. Uh, and he will address some of the most important issues of the day, of course, in general, and also specifically to the Estee Lauder companies. Um, so William, great to be with you again, uh, even if it is virtual. And I, I as I said before, I, I hope that this thing will lift so we can go back to having breakfast, lunches, or a cocktail now and then, which as you know, I cherish very much because I must tell the audience that every time I'm with you, I learn a ton. And even though uh, Deborah didn't mention it in the opening, uh, you know, William is a professor uh, at Wharton. So when I get a couple of good hours with <laughs> William, it's like I have a Wharton professor all to myself. Anyway, and, I, and he's a terrific teacher, by the way. And of course, he's got a lot of experience to teach his, his uh, young people with. So um, anyway, William, thank you very much for joining us today and taking time to do this. So uh, I want to start with a little bit of context, which, which I have to throw out there. Um, you know, it, it is now a huge understatement uh, to say that we're coming off of a tumultuous year, probably one of the most in history, for sure. And, you know, it's kind of like the perfect storm. You know, it's a, the raging pandemic, uh, which, you know, caused enormous uh, disruption. And I must say, in a lot of cases, destruction. Uh, it has accelerated civil unrest um, that, quite frankly, has presented unprecedented challenges to every retail and brand leader across the industry like never before. You know, it's responding to consumer demand and impatience uh, for change, uh, which has upended uh, many of our policies and corporate cultures. So to start, um, it's impossible to avoid uh, the, the topic. It's top of mind, it's immediate. It's the issue of the moment, quite frankly. Um, and that is the second or third wave of the pandemic, however you wish to describe it. Uh, it's the unknown of how the economy will be impacted once again. And of course, we are now in the middle of the most important retail selling season of the year. Oh boy. Anyway, uh, we don't want to dwell on this because I think our overall topic is much broader and has longer term uh, relevance. But having said that, William, could you <clears throat> give us a very brief picture of, of your finger on the pulse of what's going on out there? Uh, what does it tell you about the holiday sales, how it's going, how they're, they are now, and how they might end up? And will the non-essential beauty category have a healthy bump in growth or will it be kind of steady as she goes or will consumers bypass beauty for more basic, less frivolous items? <clears throat> I don't expect you to give me numbers and so forth, William, but can you give us a 
quick, broad perspective on what's going so, on. Yeah, there's a couple of things, Robin, which is important to understand. So in the macro perspective, I think that this COVID uh, impact, and I'll really, uh, I'll, I'll stick to North American retail for, for, for this, for the purpose of this conversation. Okay. Yeah. One of the things we're seeing is that what was a slow trend, what slow trends have now been accelerated. In other words, macro issues we saw coming, but we thought it would be a long, slow move have all of a sudden accelerated. So for example, bricks and mortar retail, with the exception of quote essential, mm -hmm. Target, Walmart, Home Depot, <clears throat> shopping, you know, HEB, but you know, stop and shop, whatever. With the exception of those, all other bricks and mortar retail, you were seeing a relatively full, uh, there was an incline in the slope going down, but it was a relatively flat incline while you were seeing a meaningful acceleration in online sales taking a portion of retail. Now the slope of decline has accelerated dramatically and that slope is going down very fast for bricks and mortar retail. And almost equally, you're seeing online accelerating dramatically to replace that. Now, the issue is though, I think this, the macro statistic was prior to the pandemic that roughly, and this is all categories other than gasoline and things that you can buy, um, was roughly online purchasing was roughly 20% of all merchandise. Yep, amazing. Now that share is going to dramatically increase. I, I'm, I can't. I would hesitate to speculate on the total, but I wouldn't be precise if it, surprised if it goes over forty in a, oh. a very short period of time. And this has had a number of different impacts. Number one, it's <clears throat> but those who might have been reluctant to shop online, that shopping online may be something that's here to stay for them. It's taught them also that those items that they do enjoy shopping in person are all that much more special for the experience. And it's really taught retailers, I hope, they've learned that retailing, I think retailing is a form of entertainment and they've got to get better at the entertainment. Yep. Retailing was competing before with restaurants and Instagram and, and you know alternative forms of media. Now that now that competition's even greater. Okay, you're not going to the move dinner in the movies anymore, and now we're being told don't go even go out for dinner. So there's a lot of things that have changed fundamentally. We don't know what a new normal is really going to be. I don't believe this is going. I don't believe the, um, they're going to come out and say it's safe to come out now. Everybody go back to the way you were without anything changed. And I think when we do, if we ever do get to that point, it'll be a long time from now and some habits have, will have changed permanently. Some retail environments will have meaningfully changed or disappeared entirely. So I think this is one of the things to think about. What we are, what we have heard, what I've heard again, again you know, macro numbers is that off price malls, outlet malls are exploding, doing extremely well. I took a drive up to Woodbury Commons not too long ago, pre Black Friday, and it was jammed, absolutely jammed. You wouldn't have known no. They were, they, you were being told to socially distance. Um, and that's just an example. And unfortunately, as you know, when you walk through Midtown Manhattan, it's, there's nobody there. Well, yeah. I'm just using extreme examples within the same area that yeah. I've seen in person. When it comes to beauty, we've seen a meaningful acceleration in online purchasing for a great deal. We've also seen a shift in categories. So for example, lipsticks, because most people are wearing masks when they go outside or when they're seeing people. <laughs> selling yeah. the way they used to, but eyeshadow and foundation and other things that make you look good while you're in front of the camera on your Zoom meetings, those sales seem to be pick picking up. And treatment, we're seeing a meaningful increase in treatment sales. Again, home personal care, taking care of yourself is a very important part of uh, our category as overall, but it's also Consumers still we feel they need to take care of themselves, and they still want to feel good as well. Yeah. Feeling good helps them, you know, looking good helps them feel good. So we're seeing a number of different factors. As far as the specific holiday season concerned, the gift-giving season, look, holiday shopping has always been a mix of one for mom, one for my sister, one for me. 
Interesting. Yeah. It's going to be one for mom and sister, one for me. I think there's going to be a little bit of a balancing between self-purchase versus purchase for. Um, and we'll see how that impacts our sales. But, you know, gift, sale, gift sales are an important part of what the retailers have to offer. And, um, you know, what's the, what's the traditional retail expression? Pile it high and let it fly. <laughs> okay, you're piling that, that it is- high, but there's nobody there to, fl- to let it fly with. So, you know, we, we as merchants and brand marketers have to be much more innovative in how we generate attention. And I think it, this, uh, you know, what's the Warren Buffett expression, which is, you know, when the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing a bathing suit. <laughs> the tide come out for brand marketers yeah. and retailers and those retailers that had substantially invested in those businesses, those, they're direct to their consumer businesses whether it's click and collect or direct to the consumer, they are doing meaningfully better than those retailers who are committed to in-store shopping. Yeah. And I believe that those infrastructures that they established will give them, a, give them long-term advantages going forward because they've established, if they've done it right, they've established an omni-channel relationship with that consumer where hopefully they can go direct to the consumer when the consumer wishes and they can motivate her to come into store. Yeah. Those items she's comfortable wearing in store or would like to purchase in store. And we know research across multiple different categories of the omni-channel consumer, the consumer who shops across multiple channels, third-party retails, own brand retail, brand.com, third-party.com. Those consumers are much more productive for us than mono-channel consumers. Yep. Yeah, I think there's one statistic that said that consumers that have more than one choice of shopping, you know, destination, uh, they will spend three to four times as much in terms of purchase. So, um, so you're not going to predict when the new normal will arrive. I, I don't think anybody can. Um, but for the SD, yeah, what I mean, do you want to throw something out there? Look. You know, if you listen to the optimistic reports, they say that by April, May, there may be a meaningful population in the United States that's vaccinated. But then when you sort of dig under the hood a little bit, you see that, by the way, most of these vaccines are take the vaccine and come back four weeks later for a booster. Mm. What's going to be the fall off there? What's going to be that safety factor? And I think there's a number of factors that will come into play into when people feel it's safe to return to a modicum of the lives we had before this pandemic. Yeah. And I would hate to speculate before you get to that point where it might be, because, you know, first you thought this is going to, you, you, this is going to be a 10 day event or a two week event or a three month event and six months and counting. So, yeah. Nobody really knows, and I would hate to speculate other than to be prepared for the surges will be coming. Yeah. And I hope that we're all prepared for for when consumers come back and they have disposable income to spend. Yeah, agility, adaptability, quick response, move your business from one day to the next, it may be different. All of those things, and they're all unknowns. Anyway, are there any opportunities that popped up during this pandemic, uh, any thing that looks like opportunities for the well, the single Water biggest company. opportunity was really the meaningful ramping up of our direct to consumer business, mm. our consumer, because obviously you know, the, the the numbers are just going up dramatically. So our engagement with these consumers is dramatic, and we know that a good deal of that engagement with directly with these consumers are consumers who previously like to shop with our retail partners, mm. but. We're not shopping with retail partners because they're not open and or they didn't feel safe going out and they prefer to they prefer a more Mm -hmm. environment where they can shop. So we're very grateful that we've had an investment in this category in in the uh, online direct to the consumer for almost 20 years now. So we have a well-established infrastructure and it's really more a matter of turning the volume up to the best of our ability, as well as a not insignificant issue for us is how do we get imaginative and creative? in new ways of selling and engaging our consumer over platforms. So for example, in the prestige beauty space, the 
one of the biggest differentiators is high touch service that the consumer receives from the expert when she comes to the store in finding the right shade, the right formula, the right product for her. She doesn't go into stores frequently, but she still wants that high touch experience would help find the right product. So we've been able to pivot to use online forms of selling and chatting, chat, social chat and social selling in other ways of using the technology to engage those consumers because I feel very strongly that over the long term, the consumer really wants to be recognized and acknowledged. The more she shops online, the better able we are able to acknowledge and recognize her because we know a little bit more about her shopping patterns. And just like you feel very comfortable going to your regular coffee place in the morning and they recognize you and say, you're going to have the usual and they know what the usual is, you know, consumers are going to feel that way too. They're going to want to come back and be recognized. Welcome back. We've missed you. Yeah. And so one of the things we have to be prepared for is maintaining that relationship with her so that when she feels comfortable coming out to shop, we can welcome her back with open arms and she can feel comfortable having come back out to shop, but knowing that she always has the alternative. Yep. It's a <clears throat> very enlightening stuff. And you guys are doing a terrific job of it. You know, um, so now to move to a little broader conversation, uh, <clears throat> the culture, I, over the years, and I've known you and your family and uh, known the SD Lauder Company culture. Um, and I must say that from, you know, it's family founding, the founding, family founding principles and the highest standards of equality for all, which I have seen, inclusiveness, diversity. Anyway, that's always been central to your culture of DNA, if you will. Um, and however, and now, of course, it seems more prescient than ever. So I know that <clears throat> the SD Lauder companies recently made a number of commitments uh, to its black employees, and to the community and consumers. So <clears throat> can you talk a little about why it was so important and to how you're making progress on that? Thank you for the question. Wonderful question. So we're a comp company completely committed to living our values and we're proud of our overall progress and commitment that we've made for inclusion and diversity. But we have to recognize that we have much more work to do in order to accomplish even greater results. Our commitments are listening and learning to foster a stronger internal culture for advocacy and inclusion, focusing on our talent and opportunity to ensure they're providing a more equitable access to professional development advancement for our employees, African-American or all others. Investing for change through a three-year, $10 million pledge from the company, its foundation, employee matching gifts and the Lauder family to support all the nonprofits and other organizations that are doing amazing work in this space to further our objectives. So very good. And I noticed that uh, you've also <clears throat> were awarded one of the top 100 companies to work for in Forbes, I believe. Yeah, so you guys have been recognized very across the board. We're very, pr we're very proud of that. That comes from the what we establish, what we create, but just as importantly, it comes from our employees and their happiness yeah. being, a, being a part of SC Lauder. Okay, <clears throat> to get a little more into the business side of it, um, how do you guys stay ahead of the ever increasingly demanding customer now more than ever, my God, uh, and particularly, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly since you are, you know, you're a global brand um, and you're, you're interacting with so many different cultures internationally. Is there anything that all customers, consumers uh, share in common, do you think? Well, you know, Certain elements of our mission are changing, but there's some other parts of our mission that I don't believe really are changing very much. Our goal has always been and will continue to be to serve the consumer with the highest quality. And one of the things I'd like to talk about, we really want to surprise and delight the consumer. Surprise her by showing her something she didn't know she even wanted. And now that she's seen it, she can't do without it. 
How can we continually be imaginative and creative? And it's ever more important now because discovery, the way consumers discover newness is cha has changed fundamentally. Discovery in the retail store was, is you're talking with, your, with somebody who's serving you, you're standing at a counter and you see a panoply of products in front of you and you reach over and say, oh, what's that? And then they tell you about it and that sparks a conversation and engagement and discussion. Now, and this is something I talk, I, 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 we, you and I have talked about before, Robin, online shopping to me is keyhole shopping. What do I mean by keyhole shopping? You're looking in the room in the store through a keyhole. You only see a narrower section of that what you're looking for. Suggestive selling algorithms sort of add to that, but it's not the same as this discovery of seeing something out of the corner of your eye and say, oh, that looks nice. Let me go out and go over and check it out. You know, the equivalent is, is you put, throw it into the shopping cart and then you don't buy it. All right. But so as a result, yeah. you have to change the way you as a consumer discover. How do we create that discovery for you and that newness? I think on a macro basis over time, you're going to see a trend to best sellers and hero products mm. and that other, you know, the, the, the traditional 80, 20 rule may be impacted in one way, shape or form. Um, we'll have to, I think we have to, you know, there's also been a monumental shift in the power. And, th and this is, again, comes from the, meaningful shift from retail to online. The more online business you have, the more power the consumer has and that editorial authority of the retailer changes because discovery is changing. Discovery is not necessarily, let me go to this retail.com site and see what they have as latest and greatest. Discovery is coming from other authorities, whether it's social media, or others who are, you know, who are considered influencers, for want of a better word. So, we have to shift accordingly in how we communicate and inspire. And you know, we're really fortunate. We've got some phenomenal brands. We're home for some amazing brands with a very diverse customer base around the world. And you know, we put our emphasis on being locally relevant to meet the needs of the consumer wherever she might be. Yeah, and I also got, I have to believe that with the internet, social media around the world, that consumers are more in touch than they ever have been uh, with their, you know, particular generations. And I got to believe there, there's a lot of commonality <clears throat> across the globe because of that, I would think. So, um, you know, beauty is... I think uniquely emotional and personal. And you know, you guys, such a large company, how do you maintain empathy, if you will, and manage the look good, feel good expectations of your customers? You know, our company was founded on the principles of high touch, which is that connection with the consumer. My grandmother, Estee Lauder, had an innate instinct for what women wanted and was the consummate saleswoman and marketer. She said, touch the consumer. And she didn't mean just emotionally touch the consumer. She meant put the product in her hand, have her try it on the back of her hand. And that's a meaningful, meaningful part. And we've been doing this for 75 years and we've created some of the best brands in our industry and the most amazing products as a result. And we know for generations, consumers have been coming back for more. Yeah, that now has fundamentally changed because now we're being told, well, touch may not be the same. So we're having to revisit all of our fundamental mm -hmm. principles that we've lived with for 75 years of how we touch the consumer to go from a physical touch to a virtual touch. That's not an insignificant, yeah. but we are adapting and it comes first and foremost by our knowledge that we still have to touch her emotionally. And finding that way to touch her emotionally is the most important thing on a brand by brand basis and a product by product basis. Well, <clears throat> so this subject is like crazy. It's, it's, it's going to stick, I believe, particularly with the new administration. But what is your position on sustainability uh, in terms of your own product development, as well as um, sourcing um, the brands you acquire and so forth? 
Well, sustainability is extremely important. And our responsibility as a company is about our citizenship in the communities in which we exist around the world as global community, a regional community and local communities. We're aiming to develop long lasting, trusting and mutually beneficial partnerships with suppliers who share these strong values and who demonstrate mm. the same commitment to operating responsibly and ethically. And we pride ourselves in our commitment in this and operating ethically. We strive to hold ourselves accountable for the impact we make and the influence for good that we can have everywhere. <clears throat> Not so easy, but we try to do it. At the heart of our collaboration with our partners is innovation. Let's work together on innovating, not just in the traditional sense, but also for quality and sustainability. And we can't take this for granted. We can't say, oh, gee, we got to look the other way. This is something that most consumers care about, and they will continue to care very much about it. We have to find a way to continue to deliver the highest quality product using the most sustainable inputs possible. You know, <clears throat> mentioning innovation, how do you incentivize it e either internally with your own entrepreneurs or you know your external vendors and so forth how do you incentivize that well first and foremost we're a learning organization we prioritize our continuous learning throughout our employees careers we offer a wide variety of opportunities to promote learning we have a reverse mentor program open doors leadership we have a, we, something we talk about a lot is leadership from every chair. We foster, we try to create this culture and, and support the culture that employees, encourages employees to challenge the status quo and to try to innovate. But in order to do that, we have to create an environment that you have permission to try, to try something new. But in order to encourage permission to try, we also have to add to that permission to fail. Very and, good. And together by saying you are encouraged to try and you've got permission to fail, which are part and parcel of the same thing, we create an environment to give our employees the opportunity to say, let me try something new. This is something that works, it, that could work. And if it does work, fantastic, go ahead. If it doesn't work, okay, we got to step back. Let's learn why it worked and why it didn't work and find a way to fix it. So part of creativity and innovation is this notion of you got to keep trying, you got to keep experimenting. It's not just laboratory experimentation, it's also innovation in marketing, innovation in packaging, innovation in selling techniques, yeah. creative innovations. We have to really, and if you look at the companies that are leading companies across multiple, in consumer space, in the consumer space, across multiple industries, the common thread is the innovative imagination of either the founders or those who came after who've continued to be creative. Consumers still are extraordinarily responsive to creativity and imagination. They want to be stimulated. They want to be entertained. They want to be excited about something. And they're not necessarily always excited about the same old thing. They like what they like and they know they want to be able to get it more, but they also want to be stimulated for more. Now our venue has changed. The way we drive the consumer has changed and we have to also innovate in our communication just as much as we're innovating in our retail presence as well as our brand presence. So <clears throat> you um, embrace risk taking? Yes. And, yeah, which I think is very good. So um, this, this will be interesting to learn. Are there certain customer, uh, consumer cohorts that you feel that you could do better with? I would say there isn't a consumer cohort where we should do better with. I mean, I, I wouldn't say we dominate. We have, we've got a strong connection with consumers across many spectrums, but the truth of the matter is, is we're constantly trying to think ahead to what our consumer wants and needs. And we have to try to excite her and bring her into the big tent. As a global company, we've got an incredibly diverse and engage consumer base. And the needs of consumers in certain parts of the world are not the same as needs in others. We have to be, we have to recognize that, which is why I said earlier, we have to be very conscious of local relevancy, that the array of products we offer is really truly relevant for the consumer in her, for her market, because, you know, those of us who live in cold weather environments in the winter time have different needs for our skin than those who live in an equatorial environment where your needs are very different. That's just an example. But one constant throughout 
for all of our consumers, all of our brands, we offer our consumers the highest performance, highest quality experiences with the highest quality products. And that is a consistent theme which all consumers really insist on and we insist on del delivering it to her. And the, long, and the most sustainable companies, the companies that have been successful with consumers over a long period of time are those consumers who've consistently delivered high quality value and experiences in the products they offer their consumers. So <clears throat> to get into the tech era now with this question, obviously <clears throat> this, this period of time in this era, era we are in um, is very friendly to entrepreneurs, which is really a good thing. Um, and of course, I think a big reason is that these people, these entrepreneurs can create a new brand. They can get it on the internet overnight. Uh, they can make great use of social media, influencers. Many of them we see going viral very quickly. The other side of that is <clears throat> that they are needing many, many rounds of funding. And I've <clears throat> said this before, and a lot of people say the same thing. A good portion of them are going to end up failing. Um, but for some of them, they're fortunate to be acquired by many of the major legacy retailers and brands today. So could you fill us in on Estee Lauder Company's overall investment and acquisition strategy in general? And then your view on how ELC looks at these tech era startups. So we're in an industry where there's an ecosystem that will support an, a, an entrepreneur's idea and vision. They'll help them formulate the product. They'll help them package the product. They'll help them make the product. There's somebody out there who will distribute it for you. You just have to come up with a good idea, design it, and promote it. So the barriers to entry in our industry are relatively low. The barriers to scale still are pretty significant, but there's a very big gap between entry and scale. And what we're looking at as SD Lauder companies is we're looking at all these green shoots that are coming out of the ground, all these new great ideas that are being created by so many different entrepreneurs. And we try to look at them and see, okay, which one of these are likely to grow up to be small trees and which one of these small trees is likely to be bigger trees? In other words, we're looking for brands that are likely to be able to become a part of our company and someday to serve our con a consumer's need. So we're, this is what we're looking at. We look for brands that we can fit into our network on a global basis, depending on where they're founded, what's the uniqueness in the space that they, uh, that they have. Now, what we have to do is we've got to constantly look at it. We're not going to be perfect. You know, we're going to make acquisitions, some acquisitions that might work and some acquisitions that might not work. And a lot of that has to do with the imagination of the entrepreneur. A lot of it has to do with some of the fundamentals that they've created. What's the, do they have a long-term sustainable business? Now, sustainability, I'm not talking about sustainability from the stand, like we were talking about before about environmental sustainability. I'm talking about sustainability of brands. We're in an industry where repeat purchase is the single most de the important determining factor. We sell it to you once and you choose not to buy it again, we've largely failed because we really do well when you come back again for to buy it again and we get the opportunity when you come back to buy it again, whether it's online or in store, that we get a chance to show you what's new, what's great and what else might be good for you. So our goal is to create these amazing products that consumers got to have and they want to have it so much that they're going to come back for more and they're gonna trust us enough, they're gonna try something else that we've created for them. So when we, if you think about that principle, it's good, it stands for all brands, whether they're gigantic brands or new brands, your goal is not to sell it to them once, your goal is to sell it to them twice, three, four times, because when they come back, that means that it's a, it's a product that's sticky, that the consumer likes, and she's gonna want more, and that's what a successful brand is built on. Okay. Um... Are there any acquisitions that you made in the past that, um, you know, you could say they, they, they were mis, you know, mistakes? 
You know, we've had some tremendous successes in our acquisition strategies. We've had some, some brands we've acquired which have not been as successful. We've learned along the way. Nobody's perfect. I have yet to hear, I mean, think about this. In baseball, we celebrate somebody who gets up to the plate and makes a hit four out of 10 times. Our success rate in M&A is better than that. And more importantly, this, uh, the return on investment for our shareholders for the acquisitions we've made, which have been successful, has far, far outweighed the yeah. negative drag on the handful. And that's really a discipline we've got to have, which is we don't want to make a fatal mistake. We don't want to make an investment. If the investment is so big that if it doesn't work, it brings down the company, then it's too big an investment. Yeah. Okay. So if you were to look back over the last nine months, William, um, is there anything that you can uh, talk about that you've learned that, that, that have been profound learning, so to speak, out of this mess over the past nine months? You know, I would say first and foremost, we mm -hmm. as a people, as species are highly adaptable. And many of us previous to COVID felt, you know, it's really important that we have to try, that I've got to be in, the, uh, you name the city for this meeting, it's important to be there. Now you travel around the world to see your colleagues without leaving home. And I think there's some fundamental changes that we are gonna be looking at in the long term over business travel, what's necessary business travel as opposed to not. I think personal travel will still, is, has always been optional, but it, there's, I think the threshold is gonna come up a little higher. And I think there's a number of things we have all evaluated in ourselves and said, okay, what is it about this experience that I like, that I wish to continue? Most, I think there isn't somebody you can speak to who hasn't said that they came up with a resolution that wasn't a New Year's resolution, that they were going to do something, learn something or do something during this period of time that they had always meant to do, but they never had the time to do before. And now everyone's doing it, whether it's to get in better shape. Yeah. After watching the Queen's Gambit, I can't tell you how many people now want to watch, want to learn chess and be good at chess. You can come up with all sorts of things. But the fact of the matter is, is that we've all learned to keep our minds stimulated as well as to be productive wherever we can, however we can. And that adaptability, I think, is going to play out in a number of different ways in the future, both in where people travel, where they shop, mm. where they dine, and with whom. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of that stuff that sticks for the long term. Um, so how do you, well, first of all, I guess talking about customer loyalty, do you guys have a, a specific strategy that addresses that in a macro way? Single biggest driver of loyalty for consumers is to offer them the greatest products with the greatest, with the best service and that they enjoy it and they want to come back for more. That's how you really create loyalty. On top of that, we have to know her. We have to really get to know her and not only get to know her so she knows we care and we want to stay connected with her. And if we can do that and incent her to do that, yeah, uh, in partnership with our retail partners, then we're succeeding in our, in our role. It's not an easy way of going about it. We ha and now the nature of engagement has changed dramatically. Think back to the pre-internet online social media world where the way we communicated with consumers was through different forms of mass media, print, television, radio, right. commuting media, however you want to look at it, billboards, posters, what have you. And you, the science and the research said that the consumer gave you about three to 30 seconds to excite her or she moved on. Yeah, I remember that. Dean, she yeah. saw a picture, she liked it, she stopped. If not, she kept going. Now the consumer, you still have to get her attention. How are you going to get her attention? But now she lets her fingers do the walking and she's engaged with you in a way that previously she was not as engaged. So there's a couple of things that come as a result. One, the consumer comes, when the consumer comes to you, whether it's online or in store, she's far more informed than she used to be in a previous era. So we have to recognize that and respect that. 
At the same time, we have to continually find ways to improve her product knowledge and information so she knows enough about it, so she feels confident. And those consumers are very demanding in making sure they do that. So we have to find ways to engage her so she feels she's part of a community, number one. Number two, she has great products and she feels good and that we care for her. We care for her health, we care for her happiness, we care for the way she looks, and, when, and that we are a, an important part of her happiness. Yeah, I think you've accomplished that across many, most of your brands, I would say, You've done an incredible job. So this is an interesting um, perspective that, that I'd like to hear from you. Do you think that in the future, there, there might, we might see another Estee Lauder, meaning your grand, grandmother, uh, create, you know, a company like this and scale it incredibly. Um, you know, some of the industry today seem to think that maybe Glossier's Emily Weiss might be another Estee Lauder. I don't know, but um, she doesn't seem interested in acquiring other brands, for example. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, think back to 75 years ago when Estee Lauder was founded by my grandparents, Estee and Joseph Lauder. At the time, Coco Chanel was alive and Elizabeth Arden was alive. And I think Helena Rubinstein may have been alive too. And they dismissed her as this fly-by-night, oh, she's not going to be anywhere. Mm-hmm. Fast forward 75 years later, and look where we are. That's not to say that that's not going to happen in the future, as much as to say it definitely will happen in the future. Somebody will create a great new brand and a great company and we'll build it. Our goal is, is to make sure that we are continually trying to identify the next SD Lauder and make them a part of our portfolio, level yeah. our capabilities on a global basis to deliver the highest quality product to our consumers around the world. Got it. So what kind of advice would you give to these young startups, for example, in the beauty. I be thoughtful, be smart, and be careful about becoming a virtual company. Mm-hmm. What do I mean by a virtual company? So, as I talked earlier about the ecosystem which supports our companies, many of these com- many of these companies, when we look at them, one of the things we see is they're virtual by the sense of they don't own the formulas of the product that's owned by the manufacturer. They don't own their distribution. They don't have a distribution network. They don't have a laboratory to develop new product. And they're literally coming up with ideas, putting it together and selling it off. Okay, fine. That's great to get started. But over time, if you don't create something that's really, truly yours, the value is the concept and not some underlying net asset. So make something solid that's yours, that's owner, ownable, really, truly ownable. Brand identity product formulation, those things are core. And if you think, think about and think about the best consumer brands, consumable, you know, consumer package brands that you buy again and again, the consistent theme is the formula is ownable, right? You know, the rep, what was the reputation of Coca-Cola for yeah. locked in a safe? <laughs> the kinds of things that are really sustainable over a long term. We are a long term thinking company. We were founded 75 years ago. And we're still going strong today because of a consistent theme in delivering the best to everyone we touch and making sure that that experience is great and that it's unique. Yeah, you, you guys have done an incredible job. And obviously that's why you are where you are. But if, if you were to start a beauty brand today uh, and anything being possible, what would it be? William Lauder's beauty brand. If I was to start a beauty brand today, you know, I would really want to fill a hole in a market in the market that I saw. I'd want it to be something that's repeatable. I'd want it to to make a difference for a consumer. They say, "Oh, this is something that's unique." Again, like I said earlier, if before you but before consumers, I'll just hold up my device, right? And we have a device. Most people have a nervous tick and they reach for their device, I don't know how many times an hour for something. Let me check this, let me check this. Most people can't do without it. 20 years ago, we didn't even have these devices. 
and we still function. I imagine 20 years from now, there's going to be new and different things you got to have. To be a really successful entrepreneur, you have to think forward in the future to say, what am I going to offer the consumer that she never imagined she wanted, but now that she sees it, she can't do without it. That is what creates really new and sustainable brands by creating something that's unique that you got to have it. And you go in to see it and friends say, you got to try this. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how do we stand on time? Have we, have we got some questions from the audience? Deborah? We have, we have um, a few. One, um, there seems to be some interest about the next gen and you know, the cust younger customers. And there's a lot of talk about purpose-driven business models and I'm in there, the, the audience is interested in what's your perspective on purpose and values and how do you, how do you make sure and ensure that they actually are, are acted upon in a business environment? And what is the strategy for running a purpose-driven business? Do you consider the Lauder Company to be a purpose-driven enterprise? Yes, we do consider ourselves to be a purpose-driven business. And I've tried to articulate those key core principles that were that are both easily understand and repeatable by everybody who's a part of the SD Lauder companies around the world. Because if we can make them repeatable, focused, and understandable, then they're better able to communicate that and what we stand for. It's also very important because we know that the, our employees really insist on this. And we have to make sure that we are reinforcing it every single day and living and walking our talk. That's number one. And that means from the top down in management and from the bottom up, we have to make sure that everybody is, what's the expression, singing from the same hymnal. Mm -hmm. We agree, and, that, and it shouldn't be something that's delivered from on high. It, the per, part of the purpose-driven business is to make sure that all of your employees fully embrace and engage and are a part of creating the, that purpose, that mission that they can get behind and be proud of. Because ultimately, especially those who touch our consumers, they have to be enthusiastic about the company they represent to their consumer because that is one of the most important elements in engaging that consumer on a long-term basis. Got it. So how do you, um, as in, in a corporate environment, how do you ensure that there's transparency to your customers? I mean, it seems to be a flashpoint, certainly among, again, the next gens that everything is everything is revealed you know where it came from how it got made the packaging it's a, touching a little bit on sustainability but a different nuance of it as a as somebody who runs a huge company how do you ensure that and and is it hard is <laughs> frankly well you you know look we have to open the kimono as much as we possibly can for the consumer so she feels confident about the sourcing of our ingredients and our packaging and how it got there the quality and the performance of our products. Those are all very important fundamentals, which we've always done. At the same time, we don't want to revert, reveal the exact formulas that are created so our competition or somebody else can mimic it because they're a unique part of what we've created for the consumer and we want her to come back for more. Mm -hmm. But the more openness that we have, the better. We know, we know that. We know that sunlight is the very best antiseptic, right? And how we, how we reveal ourselves when engage her that's the basis of trust that we have with our consumer so here's another question when um and this is sort of like a basic transactional question in a way so if you go to a, if you go to a bloomingdale's for example and you go to the lauder counter counter there's a good chance you're going to walk away with more than one thing because these um your reps are gifted it, it helping you understand all the different things that, that could enhance your look and appearance. How do you do that online? How, what is the solution for that kind of, you could call it an upsell or an enhanced sell? How, how's that gonna happen? It's some digitally? of the things that I talked to earlier, it's, we call it social selling or it's online chat. Now, you know, if you go onto our sites and there's other, other companies that do the same thing in other categories and in our category too, where if you spend a few minutes on the site, a little chat button pops up and there's somebody who says, hi, I'm Deborah. What can I help? Can I, how can I help you find? Mm. Now that's a replication of the experience that they, you might have in store. Right. Where 
the consumer walks into the shop right away and you don't approach her immediately. You say hello, you acknowledge her, but you let her browse. And then when she seems interested and focused on something, you come over and start to help her. So we do that virtually as opposed to in-store, and we hope to be able to go back to doing it in-store and virtually too at some point. So that's an important element. Again, how can we recognize her? Now, in some ways, the technology allows us to recognize her when she comes to our own brand site much more easily than in-store because of the way the technology works. Of course. Think about the different places you go back to and all your passwords are saved and you go there and you're right there and it says, welcome back. They know you were there before. So we have to find ways to, again, to make that consumer feel important to us. Because when we make her feel important and she knows that we care, she feels more connected with us. And as she feels more connected and trusting, that's where the real relationship is solidified. Of course. So um, on a different tangent, have you guys experimented with virtual reality or augmented reality at all? Can you envision, not necessarily your future beauty brand, but envision a situation where I have an avatar, I am an avatar, I have an Estee Lauder avatar helper, you know, personal, personal service person. And all of this stuff happens in this created virtual world where I can try on different products and do makeovers and things like that and actually buy it online through a whole virtual delivery system. There's all sorts of technology out there we've used and some of it we have in store and some of it we're trying to use, deliver it, um, you know, virtually on a remote basis. But yeah, I mean, you know, we've had, we have some in-store technologies where the consumer goes up to what looks like a mirror. There's a camera there, or it's a, it's sometimes it's an iPad, like the tablet device. And it recognizes their face. And then you pick the color of the lipstick you want, and it knows where your lips are, and it puts the color on. You know, just as an example, these are the kinds of things that already exist in one way, shape, or form. Different companies, different brands, different technologies, with different forms of development and evolution. Is it the same as the tactile experience as trying it in store? No. Is it the best that can be done right now? Yes. And I think if you think of the disintermediation of technology overall, those, technolo those technologies that were able to supplant and improve upon the retail experience are where virtual selling has really shown. So for example, yeah. Amazon was the death knell for most bookstores. Why? Because you could experiment and you could try reading a sample a chapter or two of a book at home just as easily, if not more easily than you could in store. Wouldn't get the recommendations of the book owner, bookstore is not the same, but as a result, the consumer said, you know what? I like this. I'm going in that direction. That's an example. Video blockbuster. I think there's what one blockbuster left in the world. Yes. Um, well, who goes to rent a VHS tape? I found in the basement of my, I, I, we had a flood in our basement the other day because there were monsoon like rains here on Monday. And when I went down to the basement, I found a plastic container with old VHS tapes. <laughs> who amongst us has a working VHS player? So, you know, I, I use those as examples to say the disintermediation of experience really comes when technology delivers a superior experience to the alternative. <clears throat> there will come a time, I don't believe in my lifetime, where technology will be able to deliver the sensory experience of beauty, the smell of the fragrance, the feel of the cream, the slip of the lipstick, the same way you'll get it in store. Yeah. But eventually it, it will be there. <clears throat> and we have to find these substitutes that allow the consumer to experiment because experimentation and trial is such an important part of building the loyalty. So William, I, I've got a question here that I know it may, may end up having to be hypothetical. Um, what do you think the, the, the pushback, is there any pushback from the prestige brands to Ulta and Sephora going into, well, Ulta specifically going into Kohl's because they carry prestige brands Target, as well Target. as- It's the other Target, way around. It's Ulta Target. Target, Sephora. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ulta Target, yeah. Um, 
You know, I, I wouldn't want to say, is there any pushback or not? I think if I put myself into the mind of the leadership of either either Sephora or, or Ulta, they've got to look at a model of saying, okay, how can I expand my reach with my consumers in a manner that will accelerate? And if you look at, look at the growth of both retailers, both those retailers have grown organically through their own sites with their each having their own strategy, but it's taken them many, many years to get a footprint of about 1,500 plus or minus locations. In a marketplace where there's, could be 5,000 locations. Are you gonna wait to fight till you get to 5,000? Or are you gonna find a way to accelerate it? And I, I go back to one of the early comments I made. This pandemic has accelerated trends that we already saw and as the result of that accelerated trends, we're seeing some established retail environments are not as compelling as they used to be. And if you're a retailer in the beauty space in particular, you thrive on foot traffic and volume. And as a result of foot traffic and volume, you really have to be in places where there are consumers who are shopping. Right. So we have to look at the we have to look at what it is that our retail partners, Ulta and Sephora, are proposing in their partnership with Kohl's and Target, and we have to look and see which of our brands it might be appropriate to offer the consumer in that environment. Well, let me ask you this: <clears throat> This is a notion that I've had for a number of years. You and I have probably talked about this. It, it, give it to the consumer. Does the consumer today, and particularly the next gen? younger consumers, do you think they care where they bought their prestige beauty product? Do you think they care where they bought? Do you think it's going to taint that brand's image in the mind of that consumer? In other words, have the channels become democratized across the board based on con the consumer? Do you think the consumer really feels that the only place they can find a designer brand is in Neiman Marcus or Saks? And do you think they care if they can find it on Amazon or Walmart? Which I believe, my own opinion, the future says that the consumer won't give a damn where they, you know, where the brand was housed. Uh, you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna equivocate on this, but I just have to interrupt. Unfortunately, this is gonna be the last question I gotta answer. This <laughs> an appointment coming okay. right after. Yeah, we're a little, um, yeah. So, the consumer is looking for authenticity, the authenticity of the brand and had, and the quality of that brand. Okay. And if they're able to consume that, find that brand with a reputable retailer whom they trust, then to answer your question, no, they might not care, but trust is not just a matter of a name on the door. Trust is I agree. connection of that editorial eye of the retailer who has culled and selected the choices to give you their vision. Right. So to a certain extent, the consumer is, if you think about it, the consumer likes going to certain shops because she gets great service. She likes going to certain restaurants because the food is great. So she's, all right, she likes the selection or she likes the environment and the way they treat me. So I don't think those fund of those change, regardless of where you are, where in the retail hierarchy you're shopping. I think the snobbery that might be existed in the luxury world before, where if it wasn't at a very, very, very fine yeah. store, I think that's been mitigated a, to a large degree, almost on a global basis, not just because of online, because the ubiquity of luxury has changed. Yep. Robin, when you and I first met each other, low these many years ago, you had a full head of hair and my hair wasn't great. <laughs> um, the fact of the matter was, is that there weren't, 500 Louis Vuitton boutiques right. around the world. There probably were five. Yep. So as the, as the reach, as these luxury brands have made themselves more accessible through their own retail online, as well as through third party partners, the notion of where you buy, what you buy hasn't changed, but the strength of the brand has, ra has been raised meaningfully. And you realize there are certain retailers still to this day that have a great editorial eye and the consumer is going to want to see what's going on there. And I don't believe that changes yeah. right now. They might not be able to go, but they are looking forward to a time when you go to see what's the, 
the emporium idea holds, except the difference is now, how do you shop an empor in an emporium-like environment virtually? You know, so now the audience will know why I want to get together with William all the time. The <laughs> professor. <laughs> I always learn, and I did today, very much so. Well, thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed our conversation. And for everybody, please stay safe, stay healthy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, William, very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.